I'm going to talk really briefly about clickers, but I also teach a class that goes much more in depth into the various uses of clickers. This is a view of a clicker, and here Kirkwood used the Interite PRS system. I'm going to bring up an additional PowerPoint. So this is my clickers PowerPoint. And my pitch, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, but my pitch is that they work. Data shows that clickers improve student engagement and performance. This is a figure I pulled from an article. Basically shows that you can expect a 5% improvement in the number of aids that you give and a 4% higher course retention. Now those are pretty high numbers in my opinion. There's some various books on clickers that you can get from Amazon if you want more detailed analysis. And there was an NPR article that you can find at this website that basically discussed how teachers turn to clickers. This is what they look like. I'm going to skip ahead to the next few slides and get to why I think clickers are very valuable. So this is what I like, is you can ask some questions at the beginning of a presentation that probes for baseline, baseline understanding. You can actually record what students think before a class even begins what students think they're already all over the material and you basically have identified those students that you can give more encouragement to. It's a way to formatively assess as you're going throughout a lecture and it actually promotes social learning because if you get a question that not many people can understand you can ask the students to work together, discuss it out and come to a more reasoned or a more collaborative answer. You can ask students to sequence through a challenging problem like a case study so you can take them one step at a time and that's similar in my mind to leading to an understanding. Again, you can take a student one step at a time into a more complex understanding. You can also ask questions that you might not think are fair on a test because they're either too difficult or they just take too much background knowledge. So I'll go ahead and go through a couple of my slides and show what I think you can get out of these. So this is the kind of question I would ask at the beginning of a lecture on the cardiovascular system. And I want to know what students already know that there's a difference between heart attack, heart failure, and cardiac arrest? Well, I would say that most people aren't able to differentiate those three. And a heart attack is when blood flow has been cut off. Heart failure is something that occurs slowly over time when the heart muscle deteriorates. And cardiac arrest is a disturbance of the electrical system in the heart. So again, what I can do is identify my advanced students immediately at the beginning of the class and ask more of them, not let them sit back and take advantage of the fact that they already have some background knowledge. And that's really important in a class like AMP, where you may have students that are going to be nurses someday and they're working as nurses assistants on a cardiovascular floor. We still want to be able to challenge them even though they kind of have a ba background in cardiovascular already. You can add some humor too, throw some more questions at them. Another thing that you can do is you can make sure that the student understands. Oftentimes the student thinks they have something down but they don't quite have it down until they've answered a question. And blood typing in anatomy and physiology is one of those where students often think they're all over it, they understand it, and they're almost there, but they're just not quite all over there. So we can actually check them. Another thing that you can do is if there's not answers that everyone agrees upon, it's an opportunity for people to get together and do some social collaboration. So a good question is one that often generates some disagreement so that the students can then come to an agreement about what the right answer is. I like that you can sequence through questions too. So one of the things I talk about often in anatomy is the thing that lands you in the hospital is not the first thing that happened. Dominoes had to fall to get a patient or to get you into the hospital. So we can walk through case studies like how Eric Lindros punctured a lung. Kind of similarly, I can take them on small questions and lead them to a deeper understanding. The specific example I'm going through here is lead the students to an understanding of how drugs that interact with potassium channels will affect heart rate and heart contractility. And those drugs are pretty commonly known by students as beta blockers. So I'm going to start by talking about AR cells and muscle action potential cells. Start leading them to the different types of drugs or drugs that affect heart rate or contractility point out that they're related to potassium channels 
And where I'm eventually going to get them to is that they kind of already understand beta blockers. I'm going to link information that we've talked in class about these two different types of action potentials to a drug that a lot of people take, and that is a beta blocker. Another thing I like is you can ask a question that's not necessarily fair, and I'm just being funny here. You can ask a question that's out of left field, not fair, and even a bit fake. Three balls and a strike to count to Brent Johnson. One out, top of the seventh inning. Fresno two, Tacoma one. Santos in a jam. Johnson his first year at AAA from the city deals. That swung on a deep down the left field line toward the corner, and this ball is going to be. Oh, it's blocked! It's not Jake Wald. That's the ball girl. Jake Wald in left field. Can't believe it. And look, she shows him up. She just sort of tosses him the ball. It's like, take that, Jake. I don't see you making the effort. Alfonso, the catcher, he can't believe it. Let's look at that replay. Oh, my. What an amazing play. And now look at her sitting there saying, no big deal. Like the All right, so that's an old Gatorade commercial, but it's clearly out of left field, not fair, and even a bit fake, and that's why I like it, because you can ask that kind of question of students if you're only asking them to do a PRS question. It's not the kind of question that you would put on an actual test. This is an example that I would also give, is I can walk them through a case study that asks them questions that aren't necessarily fair, wouldn't necessarily put on the test. And so this is the case of Jennifer Strange, who died of water intoxication. I will be here right now. Has anybody showed up yet for the contest? I'm not sure. sure. We told them to be here by 6 a.m. Right. And then at 6 a.m. we're going to... So I'm not going to play through all of that, but basically these are questions that are too deep, too difficult to ask on a test, but I can walk the students through this. What I hope is an engaging case study, question by question. My number one reason to use clickers is I can make all of my course material available outside of class in electronic form and not have to worry about attendance. So I can do exactly what I'm doing right now, which is record a PowerPoint for a student to view. And then they have to attend to get their clickers questions. So it's completely freed me up to make DVDs of all my course materials, electronic recordings of all my course materials, and still have something that requires them to attend. There's a lot of other possible outcomes with clickers too. They offer consistent reward. They're confidence building because you can ask them multiple cho choice questions that they know are tough and they're getting them right or you're walking them through why they got them wrong. It encourages attendance and enhances retention because students don't let themselves get behind because from week one they're studying so they can stay up with their questions. It kind of resets attention. You naturally see students when a clicker question comes up, they kind of wake up and grab their clicker and it kind of resets that clock of when they're getting bored again. It allows me to repeat questions over and over because that increases student performance. And it also demonstrates that you really care that your students understand what you're listening to. You're not just summatively assessing them, but you're also formatively assessing them. And that demonstrates to them concern for their well-being and their understanding. That's the end of my presentation on clickers. Let's go back to our index.